in Mark's reading this morning, it's the beginning of what I call Jesus' rock star years, where he's adding to his fame. The more he talks, the more people know about him, the more they want to see him. The crowds just keep growing and blah, 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 rock star. Uh, today's scripture has a couple things going on in it. First, Jesus goes to the synagogue and he talks to, he reads from the, the scrolls, presumably, and he sits down and he teaches uh, the people who are there in attendance. And the synagogue was an interesting phenomena uh, in this time in history. No one's really quite sure where it emerged, just that it came out of uh, a time when the, uh, a lot of the Hebrew people had been in exile in Babylon. And when they came back, synagogues came back around that time. Not sure if it's a direct relationship or not, but the synagogue was a place that it, it's more than just a, a church gathering that we would recognize. It was a place where um, lawyers practiced, where teachers, where education happened for the children as well as adults. Community gatherings were happening. I mean, essentially, it was a, it was a large multi-purpose center where they also worshipped. So Jesus comes into their worship space and he talks with them. And the question of authority comes up. Now, we looked at that quite a bit at the end of Matthew last year, uh, when repeatedly the um, temple authorities asked Jesus where his authority came from. The thing was, the authority that people were looking for was almost like a royal decree, where that he would come with a, a statement. Jesus was a nobody. He was from a backwater town of maybe 200 people in Nazareth. And he started this ministry out of nothing it would seem but he went into the synagogue where he met with the authorities now this is a really rigid class structure kind of time in, in uh, Hebrew history and the scribes and the Pharisees they were given a great deal of authority because they were the special learneds they were the ones who had taken the time to study and were chosen to be the the spiritual and worship leaders of that community and Jesus comes in and he talks as though he's got greater authority than they do now, a bit of a stop on that one. The, in the culture of the day, there was a definite spiritual hierarchy, and I'm not talking just the authority in the temples and, and uh, the synagogues and the community. I'm talking a spiritual hierarchy that had animals on the bottom, humans came next, then came angels, demons, anything that, um, that was kind of low-level heaven-based. Then came the archangels like Gabriel and Michael, and then came God. So there was a definitely a sense of authority. And those who were in authority could speak to those below them, but not above them. So humans were three steps down from God. Now, they could subject animals because animals were below them, but they couldn't subject the spirits of the world. They couldn't subject God or anything. They had to listen and be the recipients. If God chose to do something, they were basically there. They couldn't counter... Uh, even though there's a, a long history of argument and confrontation amongst themselves, when God did something, it was done. So it's this level of authority that the scribes are also talking about. Like, who does Jesus say to have authority over us? He's not only socially inferior to us, he's spiritually just the same as us. So where does this authority come from? And we see glimpses of it, of his, of his uh, status as God's son in the scripture today. But the one who identifies it are not the leaders. It is the demon that is possessing one man who comes in. So again, there's that authority. The demons are above humans. God is above demons. The demon recognizes Jesus' authority. Therefore, Jesus' authority is above demons. So it's, it's a little bit convoluted, but as we proceed from the scripture, some really interesting things are going to happen. Now remember, this is Mark. Mark is the gospel that is essentially um, based on a Greek-style drama where those within do not know what's going on. Only the audience has that benefit, except the demons. They recognize Jesus as the Son of God. In right away, Jesus says, be quiet. Don't say any more <clears throat> and get out of this person. The, the whole thing about demons is actually kind of difficult for liberal Christians. Um, I'm, I'm walking in with a little bit of trepidation myself because we don't want to think in terms of uh, in a personified evil that contains people. 
but that's exactly what this demon was doing. And we also have to remember, we're talking first century Palestine. These folks did not have scientists the way we understand it. They didn't have medical professionals the way we, didn't, we understood it. If something was going on in the human body and they couldn't see it, like there wasn't a, a broken bone or an obvious blood uh, infection, they assigned it to demons. Everything from mental health to mental illness, um, accident prone, um, you name it. A woman who had, an, who had ser a series of miscarriages was identified as being demon-possessed. This is, this is their only avenue to explain the unexplainable. Unex but the demon should not be a personified thing in our 20th first century hearing. Uh, one of the, the cool things about what I do is when I research to preach every week, I never know where information is going to take me. And one of the interesting rabbit holes I fell down this week was actually talking about uh, a new take on addiction. And they were talking about a study done with rats a number of years ago. Some of you might have heard about it. It was quite infamous. This um, researcher put two bottles of water in a cage with a rat. One had heroin in it, and one was just plain water. And every time he did this experiment, the rat would go to the heroin and drink and drink and drink until they killed themselves. And every experiment did this, or, or at least the vast majority did. So he concluded that when people were hooked on this narcotic of heroin, they had no choices. They, it was getting that drug that was the only thing that mattered. And a social scientist a number of years later looked at this experiment and he said, wait a minute, it's one rat in one cage with two bottles of water, nothing else going on. So the social scientist did the experiment again, only this time he created this rat playground where there was all sorts of activities and there was other rats. And he put the bottle of water and the bottle of heroin. And as any curious creature would do, the rat tasted both heroin and water. Decided right away he didn't like the taste of the heroin, so went to the water. The heroin was almost ignored completely. So the conclusion out of that um, experiment was that left alone in complete isolation, a social creature will go to its one source of distraction, of comfort, no matter how bad it is for them, meaning the heroin. But you put that same rodent into a world where there's color and there's light and there's community and there's support and there's options and there's variables, they won't go for the narcotic. They will go for what's good for them. We can extrapolate that to what's going on in our scripture today. Uh, many of you be familiar with uh, Maya Angelou's book, um, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. It's her autobiography of her early years. And she took that name out of a poem written by Paul Dunbar called Sympathy. And he wrote, the, he wrote in the late 1800s. He was a child of slaves. He was born in 1870, I believe. So he wasn't, it didn't experience slavery, but his closest relatives would have. And the poem was about slavery and about how they were fighting against this injustice and they would bruise themselves and they would, know, they would sing, but it was all about the cages they were kept in. If you were a minority person, if you were a woman, you know very well the anger that comes after a while of constantly being treated like you're a lesser human being, you know, just sit there and smile, look cute, don't do anything. Complete denial of a woman's intelligence and their intellect. And it's agonizing to be able to have all of these thoughts and have this wall of patriarchy telling you that you can't contribute anything meaningful. We look at class structures. We see all these people who are intellectually and, and um, artistically talented, but because class structure is such that it keeps the poor on the bottom while the money keeps rising to the top, we have incredible amounts of frustration in people who aren't even given a chance because they don't have the avenues to success that richer kids have. We look at racism. People who have kept brown and black people down, much like the poem Sympathy, they talk about being trapped, not allowed to be their full human, and it goes on. We can talk about abled people and disabled people. We can talk about um, trans people and cis people. We can talk about age. 
How many elders have so much to offer? How many children have so many bits of wisdom, but yet they're not in the core that has power, so they're often ignored? Everywhere we look, we can see people caged. We can look around our communities, our churches, and see people caged. The demonic possession of this one in the Bible was caged. When Jesus lifted that cage, when opened that cage, the demon left. We don't know if this was mental illness. We don't know if this is mental health. We don't know if this is heavy depression. We don't know what the actual circumstances were to be described as having this demon possession. And, and in many ways, it really doesn't matter. Because he was freed of this thing controlling him and connecting him. And he was done in the middle of community. And one would hope that all of those around who had been listening to Jesus were paying attention to what had happened to this man. Sure, they acknowledged the demon had been removed, but did they really understand what Jesus was calling them to be in replace of that demon? Remember the rat experiment where isolated, a person will go for the heroin or the addiction simply because that's the only avenue to escape their reality. But in a community surrounded by love and companionship, they will make the healthy choices. The man who was demon-possessed had an opportunity now to make the healthy choices so long as the community was gathered around him. And that's why we have the church. One of the uh, frustrating things that people talk about with this COVID isolation and lockdown and being, being kept away from each other and the mental health issues that are arising is because we're not allowed to be in community. If, if you read the message boards, people aren't missing sermons. There, there are more sermons now online, including my stuff, than there has ever been. This past year saw a proliferation of sermons and musical contact on social media. It's not the that part of our faith that people are missing. It's the community, it's what surrounds us. We miss being with each other. And even though intellectually we know it's for the best and for the long term, it's still hard in the short term. We are caged. Jesus gives us an opportunity to break free of that cage. For the demon possessed, for the class oppressed, for the ability challenged, for those who are dealing with racism and sexism, and ageism, and you name all the isms. Jesus gave an opportunity to break free of that. And the way he did that, it wasn't just walking around and saying, I command you, out, gone. That was just the first step. He built community. His message was all about bringing community. The scribes dabbled about whose authority he was and who was this incredible person who was getting more and more attention. That was their issue. That was never Jesus' issue. Jesus was all about creating a place where everyone felt welcome, everyone was valued, everyone's talents got to be used. We are all in a cage of some kind, maybe several cages, depending on the level of isms out there. But the community that Jesus offers us is a way to break free. So the decisions we make are healthy for us, are good for our long term. They're not short term reactions to problems that seem beyond us. Jesus gave us solutions, gave us something different. All we have to do is now be part of community. All we as a Christian community have to do is reach out to each other. Yeah, we can't be in churches this week, maybe not for several weeks, maybe not for several months. We don't know the future, but we have more communication ability available to us right now than we ever have. And it's not just about reaching out to our friends. That's easy. We can do that all day long, any week. But the community is also reaching out to people we don't spend time with. The family who just dropped in once or twice, you see them around town, you know who they are, reach out to them. How are you doing? You were on my mind. I was thinking about you. I don't want this to be creepy, but there's so many ways you can enter a conversation. The old folks who are left on their own, I know quite several who are caged by the weather. Winter means that they are left inside. Are they only hearing from people that are familiar to them? Or are they getting the wider community? It is in our capacity as Christ's hands and feet to reach out to make that community. Do we have people in our lives with addiction? We've been told for so long we have to do the tough love thing. Put them out because they can't possibly be of any benefit to us. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus is saying in this passage and in his ministry. 
We have to reach out in love to those who are broken. And maybe, maybe, with the strength of our love and encouragement, they can find their way back. But it's not for us to decide that they aren't worth our time. Christ has already decided that they are. So be that community. Jesus spoke with authority, the authority of God. We have to listen, and we have to break people free and be there for them when they need it.